everybody. This is Lisa Chiu. I am the founder and CEO of Anchor Taiwan, also the co-host and curator for the session today. Anchor Taiwan is a platform focusing on ecosystem building and venture capital for cross-border innovation. It is with tremendous pleasure and honor to gather so many of you from around the world to talk about innovating with and within the traditional industries. This is our third Asia Venturing session. Every month, we invite industry leaders from both East and West to share, inspire, and connect. Previously, we talked about the corporate venturing and CVC landscape in Asia. We also explore cross-border opportunities around tech-driven mobility. You can find a recap and video replays throughout our social media channels. In the future, we will have more sessions about Asia's supply chain-boosted innovation ecosystem with some upcoming topics like how do global unicorns leverage Asia from zero to exit, and the new trends in the capital markets that founders and investors alike should be aware of. Today, we are going to explore the traditional industries, including the players you may or may not have heard of who are powering the world's economy behind the scenes. For example, in Malaysia, where one of our speakers, Rachel Lau, is from, there is the biggest disposable rubber gloves manufacturer in the world, Top Glove. In Taiwan, we have some of the world's biggest producers in screws, car parts, and bikes, among other things. A lot of these companies are sitting on tremendous cash balance while looking for partners for innovation. On the other hand, a lot of these companies also offer incredible investment opportunities with attractive profiles. If you know where to find them and how to work with them, you can open up a whole new world with possibilities of powerful partners or investors in Asia. Today, I am bringing together three speakers representing global brands, manufacturing giants, and capital markets. Did you know that Lululemon has a general manager sitting in Taiwan in charge of its global supply chain except the Americas? We will look into how Lululemon works with their Asian vendors and partners and why Asia is crucial for its corporate innovation. From the manufacturing side, you might know the biggest bike manufacturer in the world, Giant Bicycle, or better yet, you might own one. In fact, if you have a Giant Bike, or if you're like me, a diehard fan of U-Bike, the bike sharing system that Giant runs here in Taiwan, tell us in the chat. On today's topic, how does Giant view M&A? ESG, and what suggestions do they have for startups? Last but not least, how can the next generations of traditional industries in Asia use capital markets to make an impact and be the bridge between external innovation and their family businesses? We have a prominent player from Southeast Asia, RHL Ventures, who takes family offices to a new play. These are some of the perspectives we will touch up on in today's fireside chat. We broke our record with the number of RSVP for today's session, by the way. Thank you so much for joining us today. I cannot wait to invite the interviewer and speakers to the stage shortly. The Asia Venturing series would not have been possible without our co-host and important partner, DG Times. Before we start, I would like to invite Eric Huang, Vice President at DG Times to share a few insights on today's topic. Eric, over to you. Thank you, Alisa. Greetings, everyone. Alisa, Richard, Rachel, Gushan, and Marcel. Glad to have all of you join the webinar. I'm Eric Huang, Vice President of DigiTimes. I'm responsible for DigiTimes Asia and lead our research team to provide tech supply chain insight with an angle from Asia. Before the panel, I would like to share two interesting figures regarding to Asian traditional corporates. How significant is the traditional industry in Asia? To answer the question, DTIMES collects the year 2020 revenues of all these companies in Asia. We separate them into three industry sectors, namely tech, telecom plus media, and non-TNT sectors. TNT industries are the highly tech-related industries under the digital convergence paradigm. Non-TNT industries thus can represent the traditional industry. 
In this figure, you can see non-TNT sector accounts for more than 88% of the total revenues in most of the Asian countries except South Korea and Taiwan. Thus, non-tech industries are the most important contributor to this country's economic growth. Taiwan is the special case in Asia, whose tech sector accounts for 60% of the total revenues of its public companies in 2020. Famous tech companies in Taiwan include the world's largest tech EMS provider, Foscon, and the world's largest wafer foundry, TSNC. Even with the dominance of the tech sector, Taiwan's non-tech sector is also competitive. For example, Taiwan's Giant is one of the world's best known bike brands. Glad to have the Giant Marcel to join the panel. Also, Taiwan has very competitive textile industry to support world's most famous sportswear brands such as Lululemon to develop innovative products. That's why our panelist, Gushan, chose to be located in Taiwan to mention Lululemon's supply chain of its global raw materials vendors except the Americas. Many companies in the Asia traditional industry are family businesses. PwC conducts global family basis survey and publish report every year. This slide cites the survey result for year 2020. The left figure shows the extent of agility and adaptability of global family businesses. The Asian participants are less competent on their digital capabilities, while the resistance to embrace change is relatively higher compared with other global participants. Under this circumstance, Asian family businesses are still eager to pursue digital innovation and technology. Like a right figure shows, this option is the key priority only second to expansion and or diversification. The score of Asian participants is comparable to the participants in North America. For example, our panelist Rachel used to manage a fund for her family capital. Now she mostly manages funds with institutional capitals. Their main investment is on food tech in order to solve Asian aging and healthcare resources problems. In brief, low corporate culture of individual firms may differ. Asian traditional industry faces the same geopolitical, economic, technological, and environmental challenges with their Western counterparts. It's important for them to innovate and transform as soon as possible for a new market opportunity and stay agile and sustainable. Now back to you, Alyssa. Thanks, Eric. Now, I would like to introduce the interviewer for the session today. For the Asia Venturing Series, all of our interviewers are keynote and panel speakers themselves with tremendous industry experience. I first met the interviewer today, Richard Dasher, back in 2018, when I was invited to speak at Stanford University's U.S. Asia Tech Management Center, where Richard serves as the director and chief executive. Over the years, I have witnessed his expertise in advising governments, startups, business accelerators, corporates, and investors. He is fluent in Japanese. Konnichiwa, you can greet him with that. And he has worked globally, especially between the U.S. and Asia. I'm so glad that finally I have an opportunity to bring him to our session and to be the conduit between the East and West, asking questions from his perspectives and joining the discussions. Richard, how is Silicon Valley treating you these days? And are you back on the Stanford campus? Well, I'm uh, going to campus about once a week now. But uh, basically, Silicon Valley, the traffic is starting to get worse. So things are oh, getting man. back to normal. I definitely don't miss that. And I <laughs> am so excited to finally have you at our session. I guess I will let you introduce our speakers. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, Elisa. So we already have our first question. And the first question is about recording of this session and how it will be available. Elisa, so can I confirm with you that you will take care of that and give people instructions later in the session? For sure, I have your back. And the session indeed will be recorded and distributed afterwards. Okay, thanks very much. And I want to thank the organizers of today's event, uh, Digital Times and also Anchor Taiwan for this great invitation. 
what an exciting panel we have today about a topic that's really important. I want to make a couple of comments up front. First of all, innovation is often misunderstood. Innovation is really about change. When you invent something, you're creating something new, but that's only the beginning of the process of innovation. The best definition of innovation that I've seen is that innovation is responding to some change around you or anticipating some change by creating new value. Value doesn't exist unless what you've invented is actually used. And value can also be created by eliminating some old way of doing things, especially in exchange for a better new way. So innovation is broad. It applies to business models. It applies to business practices as well as to technologies and products. It's all about change. The second point is that we're in the middle of an era of incredibly great change. It's often called the fourth industrial revolution. What's happening, and I think this is reflected in Eric's comments about uh, people in Asian industries feeling less confident about their digital capabilities, is that digital technologies are calling for change in all of the fundamental business relationships there are, whether it's company to customer or company to supplier or company to competitor. Also, as digital data and digital technologies continue to move into the cloud, where really there aren't borders, it calls on us to think about international business and global competition in new ways. Yes, of course, this is something that everybody worries about. And I really have to say the organizers have come up with an absolutely great panel for this. I want to introduce each speaker briefly, just give their name and job title, and then ask each speaker to give about five minutes of opening remarks about their story, how innovation has affected their company in the last four or five years, and maybe a little bit about what they really want to see from innovation in the future. So our first panelist, I'm going in alphabetical order, is Gulshan Kumar, who is the general manager of the Taiwan subsidiary of Lululemon. And our second panelist is Rachel Lau, who is the co-founder and managing partner of RHL Ventures. And our third and certainly not least speaker is uh, Marcel Yang, who is special assistant to the CEO of Giant Bicycle. So let me ask Gulshan, if you'll start us off, how, uh, tell us more about Lululemon, what it's like and how innovation has affected you for the last four or five years. Thank you, Richard, and uh, good morning and uh, good evening, everyone who is uh, on, on this call from around, around the world. Uh, as, as Richard mentioned, my, my name is Gulshan, and uh, as a general manager of Taiwan LLO, I'm responsible for managing supply chain production and, and quality management for all global raw material vendors except Americas. And for some of our audience, uh, not from apparel or textile field, Lululemon is a technical athletic apparel brand designing gear for yoga, running, training, and everything in between. But we are more than just that. Uh, a little bit on, on my background, you know, after graduating with, with majors in textiles from the Technological Institute of Textile and Sciences in India, I've been working in this uh, apparels and textile sector for past 24 plus years. And throughout my career, I worked with hundreds of key industry vendors globally, with at least uh, the last 15 years residing in Hong Kong, Shanghai, and in Taipei. Uh, prior to Lululemon, I had the fortune to work for PBH as, as director of raw materials, and uh, at Puma as group head raw materials, managing a sourcing portfolio of approximately $300 million. Uh, going back to Richard, your question on how innovation has affected you know, our company or our business or what has been the biggest change in the last five, 10 years uh, for our company, I would say uh, as a company, our foundation is built entirely on, on innovation. That's how we started innovating and introducing yoga pants. Um, 
and then gradually you know through the power of innovation we have been you know um, expanding and and if you if you just look at the results the q2 results we announced uh, last week uh, uh, which was really uh, i would say really em- uh, reemphasize our kind of uh, belief in the power of innovation um and the biggest change that i've seen in last 5 years i would say is our emphasis on tech and also on sustainable innovations thank you thank you golshan let's uh move right along and let me ask uh rachel if you'll go next from the standpoint of someone who's involved in investing what sort of things has uh you know innovation done for your firm tell us more about rhl ventures if you would sure uh thank you richard um good morning good afternoon good evening wherever everyone is um so rhl is a private investment firm uh we do mostly venture capital at this point um we manage over 600 or 600 million um aum um in the venture space uh essentially you know the way that you know we've looked at uh that innovation is change as you rightly pointed out. Uh my background has been in hedge funds and investing in the public equity space um and basically over the years um we've seen a change in the way people have invested um the way that corporates have innovated and the people who have invested in growth have been the ones that have moved forward from uh times of today in a sense that you know they've they've weathered covid a lot better than the rest of the people and i think that's the most you know timely example at this point you know they've stayed more relevant than anyone else and also you know as you know El- elisa has rightly pointed out um it then comes with you know being rewarded in terms of share prices you know coming back to myself um again i was in new york australia in hong kong working as a as a fund manager investing in public equities and emerging market debt um i came back uh in 2017 to start RHL Ventures with the view that you know while the US um and well the US and north of north asia was growing significantly we saw southeast asia growing much faster than the rest of the world um you know couple, mostly because of the politics right um we had you know great talent coming back to southeast asia um in in chinese is highway you know coming back um to southeast asia um with the existing talents that they had or the experience that they had there's more capital coming into southeast asia but also at the same time you know you've got a young vibrant demographic of um citizens coming up and you know one thing that consumerism and consumption um that we've never seen around the world besides in china and india And so you know the thesis was obviously leveraging the change of times but also the innovation of technology uh that plays a part in everyday life. Um and so again the the we've invested uh mostly in Southeast Asia. You know we used to do the US and then now we're predominantly focused on Southeast Asia. Um we look at food tech a lot. Um and that's something that you know food security, healthcare um insurance you know the things that are very typical day to day things that touches our lives thanks rachel that's a great opening i'm going to keep moving right along and ask marcel if you'll tell us a little bit about giant bicycle and um uh, you know how what is innovation to giant Thank you Richard. Uh good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone. Uh so a little bit about Giant Bicycles. Uh we are the largest uh high quality bicycle manufacturer in the world. We have uh over the span of about 5 decades we're approaching 50 years old. Uh and we have expanded to a global footprint of, you know, manufacturing, sales and distribution. So and we are really a global full value chain company that serves the cycling needs of people worldwide. Uh so in terms of innovation within Giant what's gotten us so far uh it's been incremental improvements. We've met uh challenges along the way over the previous decades and it's always been that problem solving uh step by step uh, and that's a really important trait and value of innovation at giant from a historical perspective 
And that goes uh, back to Richard, your point about uh, innovation being just problem solving uh, and making changes to business models, to uh, technology, to service models, all of that. Uh, in terms of the impact that we see uh, in the past five to 10 years, there's been several, uh, looking back, uh, several things and concepts that have taken the headline, things like the sharing economy, e-bikes and IoT, uh, even the home exercise movement uh, that's been galvanized by the COVID lockdowns. All of these things are, are really big headlines, but I would really say um, some of the things that Giant have really uh, taken a step forward in, in response uh, in these times of change, one being the sharing economy, you know, people still probably remember the whole bike share uh, boom of several years ago. Giant has made a play into this space, uh, but in a very specific manner. Uh, Elisa in her opening mentioned U-Bike, and that, that's been Giant's play. Uh, we, we position it as a public-private partnership between Giant as an operator and uh, equipment provider, as well as local governments as, um, as our on-the-ground partner in terms of promotion and making sure the infrastructure is there. So for us, it's really about uh, serving the public need for that last mile transportation. So if you were anybody that's outside of the US, uh, were to visit Taipei and you're taking our MRT subway system to get across town, get out of the station, there's more than likely a U-bike station with bikes available on the spot. And there's likely to be an empty station for you to return to, uh, to return the bike uh, at your intended destination. So it's that very simple promise of bikes where you need it, stations where you're going. And that's the core sort of promise that uh, Giant is focusing on in response to the whole uh, sharing economy space. And so, you know, for me and for us at Giant, we're very, really happy to see the popularity of U-Bike in Taiwan, serving millions of last mile transportation every month. Um, and we've seen this kind of change in the character of each city uh, where this has been in, uh, you know, streets are becoming safer, the air is cleaner, and especially the old and neglected neighborhoods are revitalized. So that's kind of one concrete example of how you know, Giant has looked at uh, changes and trends and responded to them in a way that's sustainable uh, and good for the public and us in the long term. Now, looking into the future, uh, probably the biggest theme for innovation at Giant is going to be ESG. And that kind of echoes, uh, Golshan, your comment about sustainability. Uh, that's on our mind as well. Um, bicycles are taken as symbols of that green world, sustainable living sort of uh, concept. And we'd really like to deliver on it in, in a very concrete way. So we're looking for uh, the next wave of innovations, teams, uh, partners to help us realize that sustainable concept for bicycles from an industry perspective overall. Okay, thank you very much, Marcel. Uh, I want to kind of do sort of a, a heads up on the format for this afternoon. We're going to be discussing among each other for a while. There are some things that we think are important to get out to everybody. Uh, we're paying questions. I noticed that, that Elisa just went through the day box and said that everything's been answered. I have taken notes on these questions. We'll come back to some of them as we go along. Um, and especially the company-specific questions we'll do a little bit later. But uh, I want to uh, go around with all of our um, panelists now and ask a question that's basically maybe the toughest one in the afternoon. What's hard about innovation in your organization? Why is it difficult to innovate in your industry and in your company? Well, Sean, what would you say to that? I would say, Richard, um, you know, uh, for any innovation to succeed, I think the what we realize is there are a couple of points, uh, you know, that. Uh, that we also advise internally as well as you know externally to our vendor partners as well is a you know don't be afraid to take risks you know or or 
embrace the failure and and be uh, have patience uh, because these things take time you know like we always start small uh, we test we iterate and then we grow it into a fully commercialized product um, so it's all about that mindset of you know embracing the failures you know uh, taking the risk and and be clear that as a vendor as well that you are you are aligned with your customers uh, you know long term vision and then once you are fully aligned i think uh, it's it's a win win situation not just for the vendors but also for big corporations uh, like us so it's interesting thing psychological issues you know fear of failure or unwillingness to take risk or even just not wanting to wait until you can really accomplish something um you see any ways around those yes for sure um as i said uh, you know when we select um vendors you know just very interesting i would like to share here is is uh, we spend a lot of time you know building those relationship and connections first just trying and understand understanding each other uh sharing each other philosophy understanding each other businesses models and once we are once we are clear that you know these are the these are the startups or the smes that we should be investing in um then it's all about you know just giving that enough time um so we have dedicated resources both internally and we also have vendor partners who have been strategic enough to have those resources at hand you know just to be working with us on all those uh, innovation ideas and and developments um this is what i always suggest any new startups or any new smes or traditional companies you know textiles is one of the largest traditional industry in the world um so we get to deal this with this uh, day in day out um so yeah as as i mentioned again just uh, having clarity on the vision just having clarity to your point like what innovation can bring into your business model not just your customer but your business model as well uh, and once that is clear i think it's is a win win situation for both parties that's great thank you we'll come back to the special role of working with um, startup companies and smes uh that's a really good point that's really kind of my next big round of questions Rachel from the standpoint of financial industries what do you see as the biggest barriers to innovation either in the industry itself or in the portfolio companies you're working with I say we invest in startups um so we're all you know very for change because the whole idea is to disrupt the existing businesses and the way you know existing businesses do business right um you know I say financial industries have been hampered by over regulations um and you see more regulations coming in and and i think with regulations is stifles growth um there's there's no better way to put this um and so when you see the fintech companies coming up you know it's very basic things right you know i mean i'm i'm sure everyone here has had the issues of going to the bank changing a password you know calling the bankers to figure out you know how to do a money transfer you know these things are very basic stuff You know, the e-wallets, for example. You know, now we can go down. You don't have to bring cash. You know, I heard a, I heard a, I'd say he's probably about seventy year old. Um, he was telling of this little vendor, and he said, you know, like, you know, when are you gonna get like an e-wallet? Because you know, having cash these days, it's not safe. I don't want to touch your cash. And so I think there's a there's a mindset change. You know, I wanted to touch a little bit on on what you said just now. You know, what's the biggest resistance? Um, it was really you know the mindset change of the older generation. But, you know even they are adapting to you know change right now because you know it's safer not to touch the cash for example you know my mother says you know like why do you want to go out and pick up groceries when you can order online you know i think this would have never happened if covid never happened so you know despite everything i think covid was a big accelerator for change um you know companies needed to innovate to stay relevant uh, to stay in front of their customers um and i think that would stay true um in the next couple of decades um you know people i think consumer behaviors have changed people don't want to go out the way they used to go out you know there's also convenience factors um the groceries are delivered to your door um you know you get a lot more selection than your typical grocery stores for example 
um, you know, now mom goes and have a look at, you know, oh, you know, different sites, you know, that was never typically available to her because she never ventured out of her typical, you know, comfort grocery stores, right? And so I think if you look at it from that standpoint, um, you know, changes here and changes here to happen. And again, you know, just to your, back to your point on financials, um, whether or not they change, changes here. And so if they don't, if they don't change, if the banks don't change, and if governments don't change, you know, the fintech companies will take over them. Thanks, Rachel. That's uh, great for now. Marcel, uh, I want to ask what's difficult about innovation in a major, you know, product manufacturer? And also, what kind of special problems were there in setting up UVibe? Thank you, Richard. Uh, I think when we go back to looking at innovation as simply change and problem solving, uh, I would say innovation occurs at a day on a daily basis at Giant, especially in our manufacturing side of things, um, because we always run into problems and we always have to solve them. Um, and what I've observed, because I did spend uh, a, a period of time on the factory floor to get a feel for things, uh, I would say innovation broadly speaking, fall, they tend to fall into those two categories, right? One is being the incremental e evolutionary process improvement. How do you make what you're doing now better? How do you serve your current customers better? Uh, and then on the other hand, you have those discontinuous disruptive innovations where the keywords of we're going to upend or revamp uh, or replace uh, a process or a product uh, or a channel uh, come into play. And I think these two things have to be looked at very differently. And in order, and, and as a company, we need both. Uh, if I strictly look at the traditional manufacturing perspective, I would say we're not too bad at the incremental evolutionary uh, types of innovation. We've been using uh, the Toyota method for, for a good number of years, and that's the driving force. Um, and it's interesting because anybody with that uh, mindset, when we pitch, especially the younger generations, when we're pitching brand new ideas, the burning question from the managers, from the more experienced team is always, well, are you innovating for better or for worse? Because what they're thinking uh, is we're a full value chain company and there's no room to externalize any downsides. And so... Uh, what ends up happening is we have this kind of dichotomy of really robust and energetic young uh, group of people that's just throwing idea after idea, but then a really tight filter uh, through which these ideas have to get kind of refined and sharpened. And so in order to let these two things kind of coexist, we are we've done a little bit of a internal organizational innovation in creating a new subsidiary called uh, advanced intelligent products or AIPS technologies for short. And they're tasked with just developing and bringing tech enabled cycling products uh, to our consumers. So because it is a brand new business unit and insulated from our core operations, uh, they are much more free to engage with a wide spectrum of startups and teams anywhere from material sciences, production technology, all the way to uh, artificial intelligence algorithms. So we kind of have to create environments for both types of innovations to thrive. And I follow up and ask, what's the relationships like between AIPS and uh, headquarters? Uh, how, you know, because I can easily imagine that they might see things moving at a different speed. Certainly, and it, it is the intention uh, for us to be able to have different units move at different speeds uh, in order to catch uh, different opportunities. And the relationship uh, has to be connected at a very high level. Um, if we're still looking at, hey, let's work on an operations level, uh, even your day-to-day -day -day kind of pace, you know, how quickly do I expect uh, a change to take place, even that cadence is different. Okay. So you're expecting the change and managing it is just a fact of life. Exactly. Uh, we're expecting the difference in speed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Kind of one thing that's coming out in this is the context 
in which everybody's doing business, especially the context of lots of startup companies, lots of incredibly rapid growth markets in Asia. Um, Gulshan, when Lululemon is considering a new startup company, a new partnership, what are the kind of things that you would like to tell the startup company to keep in mind? As I uh, mentioned earlier, Richard, any new you know, innovation ideas takes time to develop um, because there are you know, rounds of iterations you know, from seeds to scale. Um, the best advice you know, I, I give to startups is number one, prioritize the companies that are serious about investing in, in you. And number two, as I mentioned earlier, is to have patience. I think these are the two most, uh, you know, uh, I would say the advice, best advices that we, I give to startups. Uh, and not try to turn every conversation into one about investment. You know, if you can solve, as a startup, if you can solve real pain points for the large corporates, you will build far more value for your business. And then investment conversations become a natural progression. And when done correctly, these collaborations can be mutually beneficial and, and can help both parties develop, gain a competitive advantage and ensure long-term successes. So I think that a lot of startup companies, their time is measured by the length of their runway. And they're really worried about a long negotiation process before they could ever even think about revenue. Um, what takes the time? What, what is, what's going on? How can they most efficiently use that time and what should they plan for? I think it's, it's just uh, to eliminate, uh, you know, before we launch any product, uh, we call, you know, different kind of uh, uh, test readiness levels, you know, TRL levels. So, so it can be anywhere between one to nine, you know, depending on, on, on that idea and how, at what stage that idea is brought to us or, or from us to, to the startups. Uh, so we would not launch any product unless we, that has gone through this, all this level one to level nine kind of, you know, like test and run, learn kind of trials, uh, you know, testings and iteration and reiteration and, and then mirror trials. Um, so that is what, as I mentioned earlier, you know, whenever we start a discussion with a startup, we'll take them through the whole process first. We'll just gauge each other kind of philosophy and understand whether both of us has that time, you know, and patience to invest into this technology, which can be the next big franchisee. Um, I'll just like to quote some examples here, you know, like when we were looking to develop uh, the next, you know, kind of wear less, uh, sorry, wear more, wash less kind of product, which doesn't stink, you know, you can continue to wear even after extensive running or any extensive sweat activity you know, uh, sweat after sweat. Uh, we brought that idea to some of our vendors. And as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the power of co-creation, this was a unique example where not just a tier three vendor, which is a yarn supplier for us, uh, tier two vendors, which is a fabric supplier for us, and tier one, which is like a finished good vendors. And, and also a machinery supplier, you know, so th it was kind of a co-creation idea where five of us, you know, got together and, and it took a lot of iteration and, you know, time to build it into a next, you can say a big franchisee. Uh, a lot of you who are familiar with our products, uh, if you can go to our stores and if you must have bought a metal Ventec, you know, tea, uh, that is what I'm talking about. So just the point is like it takes time. Uh, it takes, it requires a lot of patience to build into something big. And that's what, you know, the advice is always uh, to the startups. So you used a word there that I think is a really important word these days, co-creation. There's so much rolled up inside that word, though, that almost requires trust in advance before you can start to co-create something. Um, how do you really see what is co-creation and how is that different from just supplying something? It's a, it's a good question, Richard. So like, as I mentioned earlier, I'm very passionate about co-creation and the power of co-creation, the possibilities of co-creation, right? Uh, so for me, co-creation is when, when uh, both parties or if it's uh, three parties or four parties involved in that are coming to a table, sharing ideas, you know, sharing vision, 
aligning on those and, and then working together on those, you know. So that's that's the power of co-creation. And as our business is growing, we feel very strong about, you know, co-creation because we have seen the success of some of those ideas in our recent past. And, and based on that success, uh, we feel even more confident now that we should continue this, this path uh, and, and build a strong, you can say, a pool of ecosystem uh, of startups, SMEs, you know, traditional players and whatnot. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rachel, let me ask you now, um, as a venture capitalist, people expect you to be investing in startup companies, but you obviously have to deal with companies in the B2B space. Do you have any kind of special things that you're looking for, especially with the companies that might fit into a supply chain be a B2B kind of play? Um, so when we look at um, startups, uh, I think we're a little bit more sector agnostic. Um, I think the, the idea is obviously to leverage off uh, the, the large consumer base in Southeast Asia. And so even if it's B2B, it's B2B to C really. Um, so we've, we've also experienced difficulties working with the bricks and mortar, well, well, I wouldn't say bricks and mortars, but also the older traditional businesses, right? So it hasn't been easy trying to sell to the B2B consumers. Um, I say things are changing a little bit. You know, we've got, for example, uh, an insured tech uh, company called Health Metrics. Um, I think if, and, and, and the idea is to provide insurance cheaper for, um, for companies. I'd say if, you know, if we went in and say, hey, we're going to charge you X amount of dollars, um, to get insurance for your people, you know, I think that would be a tough to, uh, to conversation to have. You know, instead we've said like, hey, you know, we know that you pay 12 times of insurance for every employee that comes to the door. But in reality is, you know, your your um, employee base, you know, the average age is 29 years old. So the average 29 years old doesn't go to a hospital or clinic, you know, a year, right? that or like they, they've got other issues um and so you know we've realized out of all the stats that you know we've done and also like we're looking at all the insurance companies really you know you go to four, four to five times a year i think that's that's probably what we would i mean the amount of time you would go to a doctor anyway like or a gp and so we said hey you know instead of you paying for 12 times we're going to charge you five times and then that's an instant conversation right because now i don't have to pay for the seven times right which i already had to pay so the underwriting is a little bit smarter um, it saves money and when it saves money and it's really, you know, you know, dollar and cents going down to the bottom line, every conversation is very easy. Um, the other conversation that, you know, we've had is, you know, uh, mental health. Again, you know, I, I touch back again a lot on COVID because it's so relevant. Um, we've realized a lot of people had a lot of uh, mental issues, not not because of anything else, but, you know, the stress of being cooped up at home, you know, the extra workload from, you know, the non-distinction of work time, leisure time, home time. Um, so, you know, corporates now have embraced to say, look, you know, we might not be able to be there for you, but hey, you know, here's a, a solution that, you know, helps you monitor your mental health. I think that's extremely important and corporates have started embracing them. Um, another thing, you know, on the B2B space is, you know, we've looked at, you know, supply chain procurement. You know, I've talked to Marcel on the side a lot on um, supply chain issues. Um, I'm on the board um, of GNC, and you know, we when last year when we when we saw this um, COVID happening, the biggest issue was the disruption of supply chain. Um, su supplements couldn't go from the U.S. to the rest of the world. Um, we didn't have enough of raw materials from the rest of the world going to the U.S. manufacturing plants. Um, we had a standstill in terms of mat from factories to retail stores. Um, retail stores couldn't get, you know, their products to the hands of consumers. Um, so we saw a big issue on the supply chain. Uh, but, you know, in Southeast Asia, it was actually predominantly your day-to-day -day stuff, right? Um, the farmers couldn't deliver their goods to the supermarkets. The supermarkets didn't have enough stock to sell to um, the consumers. And the consumers were left with more expensive less, you know, quality uh, produce, where else, you know, you saw farmers throwing away their produce because they bought perishables. And so we've invested heavily on this food supply chain uh, because of that. Um, getting um, fresh produce consumers to the, from the most vulnerable farmers 
to the hands of consumers and also to be fair a lot of ways bypassing the traditional retailers um, and so cutting down the middleman and you know increasing the margins for the farmers and of course decreasing the cost to the consumers so I think you know it's it's we we invest quite a bit in the b2 b2 c space um, but I think that's also the most relevant thing um, at this current juncture so Rachel, I also want to thank you for giving a case study of exactly what we were talking about with the definition of innovation. Here's mm-hmm. change going on around us, right? Like COVID-19 and, and shutting yep. down supply chains. You, your company saw that as an opportunity to invest in innovation. Mm-hmm. So I think, I think that's neat. I have a follow-up question that really takes us to one of my last two points that I want to get everybody's opinion on. And that is uh, sustainability and ESG kind of considerations. Is that another change that's having an impact on your investment uh, philosophy or strategy? I think for us, for you first. Sure, um, for us, uh, it matters. It's always mattered. Um, I think if you do good, um, you would do well, and I think it's really as simple as that, right? You know, our our motto or our vision in RHL is to support uh, the people who never had the privilege um, um, to do, to, I guess, in, in, in a less better way, you know, the less fortunate um, or giving privileges to, to everybody um, to innovate and to change. And, you know, like the way we see, it, for example, you know, G-Life, you know, the, the conversation that we had just now on, uh, you know, food procurement, um, it's really to embolden uh, younger farmers. Um, less fortunate farmers who don't understand how to get to the consumers, right? And, and there's usually typically, so in Malaysia, for example, for a farmer, you know, there's probably like five middlemen before you go to a retailer. And after the retailer, you know, there's another two, cons- two, two middlemen that go gets in the way before you get to the consumer kind of thing. Um, you know, that's typical of Southeast Asia. In Indonesia, there's usually nine to 11 um, middlemen in between, you know, farmers to consumers. I think the way that we're looking at it is obviously, you know, to, you know, my, to shorten that gap in terms of delivery time, you know, increase consumer satisfaction, but also, you know, decrease um, uh, carbon footprint um, and therefore sustainability, um, but also, you know, at the same time to, you know, give back to the environment around us, right? And I think the stakeholders, uh, you know, the little mom and pops that never had that opportunity, um, you see that having the opportunity right now in Indonesia, it's really the smaller guys uh, that are benefiting from this tech boom. You know, they typically couldn't reach the, the you know, the, you know, if you're in, you're in Bandung and you're selling, you know, crafts, right? They weren't able to reach um, the guys in Jakarta or even the U.S. Now with Tokopedia, for example, you know, you can put your things online and then it reaches consumers overseas. Um, and it really is just putting it a, a stamp and an envelope inside it. And, and, and kind of just shipping it overseas, right? And then, you know, the significant margins. And so I think for us, it's, you know, helping the, the people around us. Um, and that's been a thematic that, you know, we've seen um, being able to be done because the technological advances are around us. Okay, thank you. Marcel, one of the, the things that people used to talk about with bike sharing and that kind of thing is that that was a contribution to sustainability. Besides... You, uh, Giant, what kind of innovations are you doing around the whole area of sustainability and ESG? Well, the, uh, that's a really big question, Richard, and I'm, th- I'm glad you asked. Yeah. Uh, the, I think for Giant, the ESG play, first of all, really focuses on the E, the environmental element. Um, you know, we mentioned the concept of bike sharing was supposed to galvanize this kind of more green lifestyle. And then we see bicycle graveyards, right? When we go back to what are we externalizing somehow? Uh, So we're being very deliberate in evaluating and putting together an all around strategy in terms of, you know, dare I say circular economy, that's like such a big dream. Uh, But really at the end of the day, are we really uh, creating value for the environment as a whole. Again, back to the not externalizing anything. Uh, as an industry and even as a society, we see you know, decades, centuries of building up supply chain in one direction. 
how, how long is it going to take us to build one in the reverse direction? Is it even possible? I think these are the central thoughts and, and innovation that, you know, we're really looking into. Um, and I think with COVID and how over the past year or so, we see, you know, the pandemic really upending some of the fundamental business assumptions that we've been making, such as, you know, usually supply greater than demand, economies are built that way, businesses end up assuming that. Um, logistics used to be very smooth. Uh, that assumption's been upended as well. And so all of these friction kind of challenges us to really rethink all of these elements and we're seeking opportunity to see, hey, is this a time for, for change for the long term? And is there an ESG kind of element that we could weave in? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think that this too is the change is happening all around us. We have to be able to deal with it some way. And really innovation is one of the main ways we can get through this sort of uh, era. Absolutely. Gulshan, let me, let me ask you, uh, we had a question a little bit earlier that was specifically about microfibers that might be uh, caused by synthetic fabrics. What kind of uh, investments or activities related to sustainability and ESG innovation is Lululemon involved with? Uh, great question again, Richard, uh, and, and very, uh, you can say, close to the work that you know we have been involved in recently. You know, source, we strongly believe that sourcing uh, more sustainable raw materials is one of the most significant ways that we as a company can make positive impact globally. So, so what we are doing is we are building a foundation in this area by prioritizing issues and opportunities like microfiber is one for sure and taking steps to understand where our biggest impacts and opportunities live. Uh, we are also taking steps to trace where and how our key raw materials are sourced to improve the visibility you know, deeper into our supply chain. I would also like to quote a couple of examples, you know, which was in the news recently as well. You know, um, like a few, few weeks ago, we announced our collaboration with a biotech startup called Lensatech to create the first fabric using recycled carbon emissions. Wow. Yeah. So, so we know, Richard, that sustainable innovations will play a key role in the future of retail and apparel. And we are excited to be at the forefront of an innovative technology like, like this from Lensatech. Also, another example, just a few weeks ago, also, we announced a multi-year collaboration with sustainable materials leader Genomatica to bring renewably sourced bio-based materials into Lululemon product. So this represents our first ever equity investment in a sustainable materials company. And for Genomedica, it was their largest partnership within the retail industry. So together, the two companies will create a lower impact plant-based nylon to replace conventional nylon, which is the largest volume of synthetic materials currently used to make our products. So just a couple of examples uh, to highlight that how Focus we are in in terms of you know bringing sustainable innovations at the forefront and uh, lead to a better you can footprint carbon footprint on our products and in raw materials. Those also sound like great examples of co-creation. Exactly. Uh, what was it about the partnership that made partnership better than trying to do it by yourself? I think we we, we strongly believe it, it has to be a collective effort. Um, especially, you know, um, the topic of sustainability or environmental foot reducing the carbon footprint. We believe it, it has to be a collective effort. And that's why we, when we announced this collaboration, we opened this. Uh, we might be the first one to launch those, but then, you know, it's, it's open later on for all the industry players to join in this great cause and, and help collectively to minimize the carbon footprint. Thank you. The last kind of thing that I want to ask about before we really directly hit more of the questions that are in the Q&A box is uh, the special place of Asia. And Rachel, let me start with you and ask you how you see the role of Asia in kind of global innovation that's going to happen from now for the next few years. 
Well, I think Asia is interesting because we've got probably the youngest demographic reaching, um, I'd say, middle income and even high income um, around the whole world, right? You know, um, we've got, um, I'd say, in, the, in Southeast Asia, at the very least, you know, your average is 29 years old. My guess is, you know, China, India is probably a little bit lower or, you know, it doesn't deviate too much from it. Um, so I think, you know, the consumers are pretty interesting. So given that the consumers are so young, you know, we're, We've adapted to the technology fast, easy. You know, when we went to Myanmar a couple of years ago, um, I said this is interesting. So it, I was speaking to the Telenor guys, and he said, you know, we know what's the interesting bit. Um, we when we first started and we came in, we gave everyone really lousy two G phones. Um, so when you buy a SIM card, it was hundred US dollars. You get a two G phone, right, to, to come with it. Um, people were chucking the 2G phones away and they were going to 3G phones very quickly because they said, what's the point of, you know, just being, you know, on the phone, right? It was really, you know, going online and, you know, having that online presence. And that was why people wanted the, the smartphone. And so, you know, I think we've seen a leapfrog of technology um, instead of going through, the, you know, what people would have thought, you know, you go through a landline, you go through a mobile phone, you know, it really is, you know, we're gone to the smartphone. Um, you know, we've bypassed, you know, laptops and desktops and we, we are using the, the smartphones right now, right? Um, and so, you know, I think with Asia, we've seen, you know, innovation is very different from the rest of the world. Um, in China, there is WeChat, um, you know, it's one platform, you get to buy things, you know, your influence. It's an Instagram, it's a LinkedIn, it's a Facebook, um, it's an ordering platform, everything is on, on one. Um, we haven't seen, you know, the, the Americans or the, the U.S. companies having to do that. Um, I think in China, innovation is a little different. You know, here we also see, you know, very different uh, innovation um, from the rest of the world. You know, typically, I think five years ago when I first came back, it was, um, you know, Uber of Southeast Asia, um, LinkedIn of Southeast Asia, or, or, um, <laughs> uh, or what is it, Facebook of, of, of um, China. And I think that, you know, that that comparison between East and West is now significantly different, right? Um, and so I think Asia would lead innovation uh, more because, you know, I think, you know, culturally um, we're very different. I think the things that we've embraced uh, have also been very different. Um, we've got a much younger consumer. Um, and we also have got a very different mindset and consumers, right? Um, also, I think additionally, I think this is uniquely in Southeast Asia, or, or sorry, uniquely in Asia, um, we've got a lot of entrepreneurs still helming, you know, the reins of their 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 companies. Um, so most founders are still chairman, or if they're not chairman, they're involved some way or another, you know, dictating the policies of the companies. And so when you've got, you know, a stubborn founder there who's used to doing businesses, you know, how they did 30 to 40 years ago, it's a little different, but I think, you know, we're, we're very different from, again, from the West, right? Where I think if it makes dollar and cents and it hits the bottom line and increases their share price, most founders are very pragmatic with the conversation of innovation. Um, so again, I think, you know, we, we're, we're different from multiple standpoints, but, um, you know, I think the, the, the last point about how founders are still at the helm um, of their companies, and I think we're slowly seeing the transition to the second and third generation, I think that's where, you know, change will, you know, accelerate in the next couple of years. Thanks. Real quick follow-up on the ESG question. And this is kind of a restatement of a question that came in from the audience. Uh, I'm curious, are your LPs sensitive to uh, ESG issues and kind of really democratization of benefits of the startup companies because I think that, um, you know, there is a sense that venture capital is all about making the winners win big. And so they make a lot of money and then everybody else is left behind, especially the whole kind of democratization issue. Are you getting much uh, dialogue with your LPs on, in, in that regard? I think we've had a lot of conversations with LPs um, and Quickly, I've I've gone back to say, hey, you know, like if I if I invest in something that is ESG focused, um, and if it doesn't do well, are you able to accept the lower return? The answer is also no. Um, so while everyone <laughs> talks about, um, we haven't really seen that you know correlate with the 
you know, potential law. And to say that that's going to be returns, right? I'm also saying that, you know, it's got to go both ways, you know, like if we're going to be investing in uh, the, the younger farmers um, or, you know, going down to the rural areas, are you going to accept a lower returns because of that? Or, or maybe not a lower returns, right? Are you going to be comfortable with a longer return period or digestion period, right? Because the reality of it is when we go down to the, the rurals um, and, and we're touching, you know, the lives of the guys who haven't had a smartphone, for example, it takes a little while to adapt to that technology. Um, and so if you're okay with it, you know, I think we're okay with that. And I think the conversation is, you know, I think people are starting to realize that, hey, you know, like investing doesn't take, you know, a day, right? The change doesn't take a day or, you know, two months or a year. You know, it really is, you know, a, a five-year thing. And for us, we have a 10-year horizon and everything. Um, because the way we see it is like change happens overnight, but it happens slowly and it, it, it's, it's, it, it creeps in slowly, right? You know, people change. And I think, you know, we were not the same people that we were a year or two years ago, right? I think that's, you know, a year or two years ago, I would be in Taiwan with everyone, you know, having this conversation in person. Um, and now we're all okay online and we're doing different time zones, for example. And I think, you know, that I think that conversation has changed. And I think people are a little bit, I'd say smarter, but more eloquent the way they invest, right? So the, the conversations have happened. I say it's not, you know, a must. Uh, but again, like, you know, the way we see it is as long as you do good, you'll do well. Um, and so that's probably how we invest. Uh, and again, like, you know, if we're going to invest in only, you know, the guys that are going to be big, you know, it's also not very fun. You want to, you, you want to back the little guy, you know, you want to back, you know, the Mark Zuckerberg who came out for college, right? You know, that's, you know, that's more a fun story. Um, so, you know, I think that conversation has happened. And I think, you know, again, like for us, um, we're, you know, we're backing young entrepreneurs, you know, the average age of guys we've backed is under 35 year old, right? So you're really 30 year olds coming in, you go a couple of years of, um, of work, you're coming in, you want to change the world. I think if, if with that lofty, you know, worldly ambitions, um, those guys do well. Um, and we like that. And, you know, again, for us, it's, you know, how do we make the world a better place? Okay. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, uh, so special role for Asia, especially innovation that might involve open innovation with Asian startups. We had a question about open innovation at Giant. So let's kind of put the two together. Well, I think, uh, Speaking from the giant perspective, uh, my, my personal exposure to giants, uh, I'm, because I'm coming from the States, so I kind of do see the, that uh, desire for open type innovation, uh, very aggressive, fast moving, um, and, and how that might, might, sur might uh, fit within the giant ecosystem. I would say uh, as a Asian originated company, uh, Giant really has this kind of purity in terms of being grounded uh, to pick, to use Rachel's words like pragmatic. Uh, that word actually pops up in our discussions a lot and it's very high grit. Uh, and so when we're innovating and we're looking at innovation, there's this very intense focus on what problem are you solving and for whom? And who, who else are you causing problems for as a result? Um, and so uh, open innovation, like we do do that on an, on an exploratory basis internally and externally, uh, both with potential startups or existing uh, supply chain partners. Uh, a lot of the times we bounce ideas uh, with these partners. Now, these conversations can get a little bit more tricky because on the one hand, we do need to co-innovate with these guys uh, to, to really bring a new concept to reality. On the other, uh, that's value creation. And on the other hand, who's going to capture that value and how? And so it's a very interesting uh, dual dynamic that's going on. And, and so it, 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 there's a lot of layers going on in these types of uh, projects and, and initiatives, but when they work, it's very exciting. Agreed. Uh, let's go to uh, Gulshan. Gulshan, what's, what's the special role of Asia, especially in innovation for Lululemon? Not, not so much as the markets themselves. Uh, Richard, I would say, you know, since uh, 
I'm, I'm based in this part of the world for the last 15 years, you know, uh, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and, and, and Taipei, and, and working with, you know, vendor base across Asia. Um, you know, I was reading somewhere, you know, that collectivist societies excel at production, while individualistic uh, cultures nurture more invention, right? While I agree to some extent, but times are changing very fast in Asia, you know. There is a collective and individual desire to be more innovative. Uh, to Marcel's point, you know, uh, there is a first order innovation that's spreading so fast in Asia. I think he, he used an excellent word called incremental innovation. Uh, and that's what we have been seeing in, in Asia for a while. Where Asia is excelling now off late is that they have been get, getting very uh, techy as well. You know, you, you get to see a lot of tech innovations coming out of Asia, um, which is to, to Marcel's second point is, is I think kind of getting disruptive as well. Um, so we have very strong confidence, you know, giving, given our experience of dealing with Asian vendors and, and an in interesting anecdote there is our first ever vendor was Asian, you know, and, and from Taiwan. And, and we are ever since a uh, close partner uh, till date. Uh, so we believe very strong about our vendor base in Asia and also the innovations, the future of innovations, you know, coming out of Asia. I fully expect to see a major technological advance coming out of Asia, let's say in the next 10, 5, 10 years that will wow the world and lead to something that everyone in the world wants. Um, so yeah, just reiterating how confident we are about our vendor base in Asia and, and, and we feel so strong about the innovation coming out of Asia. Okay, thank you. Quick question for everybody. This came from the questions. So what is the most exciting new technology in your particular industry or that you're looking at right now? And also are there must have, a set of must have technologies that you really need? Um, let me go with Rachel first. As the investor in these, what is the most exciting thing you're seeing now and, and what are the ones that you really gotta be playing in? Um, for us, this is probably alternative protein, right? Um, I think I've tried everything that you can think of. Um, there is, uh, lobsters without shells. Um, it's quite interesting. It comes in a form of minced meat. Um, there is, uh, uh, eggless eggs. Um, it comes in a form of a, of a powder. Um, that's interesting. It comes out. It's it's white. It's it's white. It's powderish, but it comes out like yellow scrambled eggs. And I'll I'll send you. But it's actually pretty interesting, right? Um, you get ninety percent of the same nutrient um, as an egg. Um, so if you're vegetarian, for example, or you're looking for a different protein source, you know that's you know that's one way to go. Um, essentially, you know we're going from seven billion people in the world. We're going to ten billion people. We've got to find more sustainable ways of feeding the population. Um, so we're investing a lot in alternative protein and alternative uh, foods. Um, and again, th this is something you know we feel very strongly about. You know, you talk about ESG and sustainability. Um, you know, we think you know by creating more sustainable food, uh, we're able to you know lower the impact. You know, people talk about you know flying and everything else, but really, you know, we also don't think about what we can do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, again, the food's you know great quality. It's it's um, equal in nutrient, uh, there's less impact to the world. Um, and again, like it's, it's unfortunately it's a little bit more expensive. Um, so, you know, I think we're solving that issue right now by investing a little bit more in R&D, but, you know, for, for, you know, a, 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 a crustacean company that we've invested in, um, it went from 10,000 us dollars, uh, per kilo to 1500. And I think we're, per kilo and we're now we're looking to you know move it to fifty dollars per kilo um so the idea wow. is obviously for yes um crustacean cheaply um or that that alternative protein to the rest of the world and again the one thing that's interesting um is that we've realized that you know the shellfish allergies that a lot of people have um it's not just um to you know it's not really from the the the, the prawns or the other uh, lobsters it's really to the shell so if we eliminate Hmm. We can have lobsters um, or, or prawns, right? And so I think that's that's probably the interesting that you know we're looking at. And again, like there's lots of alternative proteins out there. 
Um, it's a healthier version, so you know I urge everyone to try it. Okay, a cr crustless crustacean. Okay. okay. Um, and it so, Marcel, what's the really hot technology that excites you, and what kind of technology technologies do you see as must have, kind of moving in the future for Giant? Absolutely. Uh, I think right now the hot topic for uh, the, the bicycle industry is e-bikes. I mean, the, the growth, the market growth rate for that type of product as a big bucket is just, you imagine the hockey stick and it's, it's that aggressive. And so uh, that's very hot. And I know uh, many people have, have reached out regarding that topic for collaborations. And I thank you for that. Uh, and, and it's really an exciting space because there, we generally see people coming in from three types of backgrounds. You have the motorcycle type of background coming into the e-bike space. You have the technology angle that's coming in and you have the traditional bicycle industry players. And that's where we come from. And so it's, it's a very uh, fascinating development to see all different interps of interpretations of, if I put a some sort of motor on a bicycle or something that looks like a bicycle, what is that like? And so uh, there are all sh shapes and forms of e-bikes uh, that are out there and we anticipate it to be this way uh, for a little bit of time. Um, but taking on the evolutionary next step sort of logic, you know, what's the next must have? Uh, well, if you play out this prevalence of e-bikes, battery recycling. That's going to be a next step. Um, and also, we talk about e-bikes in, in terms of emissions reducing. Well, are you really reducing emissions? If you take into account the full product life cycle, uh, including the usage as well, and end of life uh, of the product, all of these things are, I think, going to be the uh, logical next steps that we have to look at, which kind of ties into our focus on ESG now. Those are great points. Gulshan, what do you see for your must-have technology and what's really exciting now? I would say, uh, Richard, uh, you know, Lululemon as a company is, is all in, you know, when it comes to innovation. Uh, and, and um, you know, our sweet spot is creating versatile and stylish products that includes technical innovation, um, comfort, which is all about, you know, the science of feel, so, so some of you might have seen recently, we introduced our media campaigns around feel um, because we strongly believe that anything, you know, that that touches skin or that's next to the skin for our guest, um, you know, should have a special feel, or feel about it. So back to the point, like technical innovation, uh, comfort and flexibility, which is all about movement. So any innovation with, which can bring this uh, to the table, we, we are more than welcome, you know, to to um, talk about those, and also not not to not to forget, you know, if these innovations can be intertwined or can bring in a sustainability angle, I think that that's a definitely a win-win situation for for both companies. Thank you. Thank you. So everyone, I just want to give you a heads up. I have one more question I'm going to ask everybody. That means I'm not going to be able to get to a lot of the questions in the Q&A box, which are great questions. And we will follow up and, and, you know, they have all been considered trying to keep some measure of cohesiveness in the, in the order of topics. Last thing, though, is none of the three of you mentioned the other big buzzword that's in innovation right now, and that's digital transformation. And I'm kind of curious, um, why not? And what is digital transformation to your company? Uh, the 25 words or less answer. Gulshan? Definitely. Uh, and and thanks, thanks for, you know, voicing this out. I mean, uh, not to be missed for sure. Digital is such a such a strong focus area, you know, and and uh, COVID has just accelerated, you know, the the need to uh, kind of invest more into that space because we have seen the the benefits uh, last year and and this year as well. Not that we don't believe strongly about you know um, 
our our stores because we still believe very strong about you know experiential you know like uh, uh, experience that our guests you know feel when they when they yeah. walk into our stores but digital is something that we continue to to expand and if you look at our power of 3 you know that's that's the whole strategy of next 5 year expansion uh one of one of the power of three pillars says omni guest experience and and digital is at the forefront of that for sure okay marcel what about giant digital transformation that is certainly a very big word uh here at giant we've been talking about it for the previous several years and and really executing on elements of it uh within the bicycle industry and really speaking for giant uh digital transformation has been happening bit by bit uh from a product perspective we see digital transformation these types of uh iot devices that are attached to our products uh, we see those as ways to augment to expand the experience of cycling and that's anywhere from the u bike system all the way to our e bikes and everything in between uh we have you know forayed into power meters that really analyzes every cyclist uh, you know what's your power output that's a, derived from the elite athletes that that's now democratized to anyone uh and so we position these types of technology and insight as a service to improve on your cycling experience uh, that's one way uh one concrete way in which we look at and think about the uh digital transformation now on the operations side uh in terms of the sales and distribution um i think i would like to echo golshan's approach about this dual channel and dual nature of consumer engagement uh it's not online replacing offline internally we have this lingo called lingo called a o plus o online plus offline how they complement each other And so again this is a very deliberate choice for us. Um and finally of course in the manufacturing side of things uh Richard you mentioned a little bit earlier about industry 4.0 the digitization of uh production that's also evolving uh in our side as well. Okay, thank you very much. So with all of this digitalization happening everywhere and this kind of thing Rachel What is your attitude toward the term digital transformation and how does it impact how you do investing? Um I think it's a necessity. Um I've had multiple conversations with government officials um especially in Malaysia over the last year and a half or so. Um we've seen, you know, SMEs or small medium businesses really struggle over the one and a half years. Um where you know they aren't able to deliver their goods to consumers um so the conversation and and I think I I never really understood that because we've always invested in digital transformation um so not being able to deliver goods is like it's it's basic 1.0 right you know like that's that's you should be on e-commerce anyway you should be on your smartphone you should be on 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 you know you should be able to work from home anytime you want because you've got a you got a mobile and you've got a you've got your 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 desktop or or your, your laptop right so i i never really understood that conversation um until really you know this one and a half years where you know like um people are just not equipped for that transformation you know like there's a lot of you know there's a lot of good intentions but never nobody really invested in it um and so you know we you know we've gone around hopping to say like hey i don't really understand why you know we're having a slump of economy you know when the rest of our our portfolios are doing well but again i think it was a very simplistic way of doing of thinking about it you know we've always invested in you know companies that were disrupting the you know, existing ways of doing businesses so you know um when covid hit for example you know the guys that you know we've invested in you know we've typically triple or quadruple um, in terms of revenues so we're like hey you know covid's great right because like you know things have been doing really well but again like i think that's not you know a reflection of the you know the the broader economy and i think because of that you know i think now you know more corporates have really embraced the work to the total transformation um you know they've allowed people to work from home for example it, um i think that's probably you know the most useful thing you know it's probably not safe anymore to just go out in in big batches um so you know why don't we look at this flexible you know work from home um structure and you know put it a little bit uh you know more permanent 
um, you know, at the same time, you know, when we do due diligence, you know, typically, you know, we used to, I used to fly out every week, right? So I haven't, I haven't been out of the country since January last year to do diligence. Um, and now everything is online, you know, it's, it's really more efficient, you know, I get more things done in a day, um, as I would have typically had in the past. Um, and then I think, you know, I think the way that, you know, we have to move forward from our traditional uh, economies uh, has, has, you know, it, it's happening, right? Um, we can't, you know, rely on what we, we've done in the past. And okay. I think that's, that's basically it. Okay. Thank you very much. And thanks to our three panelists who have demonstrated how innovation is all about keeping up with changing times. Mm -hmm. And moving ahead, creating new value, creating better experiences, all the inventions are the tools and only the tools. So I thanks to everybody for being part of the program. Let me turn over the microphone now to Elisa. And if you would help wrap us up. Thank you, Richard. And also Rachel, Marcel, and Gushan. What a panel and incredible discussion. And I have to say, man, because, you know, like I got to keep um, an eye on what's going on in the chat room. What an incredible crowd as well. Thank you so much for spending either your evening or morning or afternoon with us. I really, really appreciate that. I'm sorry that because of the time, we cannot go through all of this incredible and wonderful questions in Q&A. But what we will promise is that we're going to collect them and basically send the copies to all of our speakers so they will get to know who asked what. And then if you were to reach out to them afterwards, um, you know, hopefully this is just the beginning of a lot of meaningful con conversations and also connections to come, not only among the speakers, between the speakers and you, and hopefully you have also connected with someone from the audience just now as well. And uh, remember that the recaps and also video replays of this session and also our previous sessions are available on our social media channels. So make sure to check out Digitimes and Anchor Taiwan through YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and so on and so forth if you want to watch the replay and do your review. So next month, we're going to talk about how global unicorns leverage Asia from zero to exit. You might be familiar with companies or products like you know, Amazon Ring, Fibbit, Peloton, Tonal, or um, Vizio. How did they make it from a tiny early stage startups, especially when it comes to navigating the complication uh, with the supply chains and hardware production? Who was the early believer for them and what kind of role did Asia play behind the scene back then? You will see the QR code for RSVP at the end, which you can scan to join us next month. Again, with that, I'm so happy to have this honor to bring all of you together. Thank you for joining us. Greetings from Taipei, and we hope to see you again very soon. Have a nice one. Bye-bye. <laughs>